Welcome everyone to Life Transitions, Staying on Track of Eating Disorder Recovery. My name is Sabrina, my pronouns are they, them. I'm the program director at the Eating Disorder Foundation in Denver. Today's workshop is brought to you in collaboration with the Eating Disorder Foundation and EQUIP. Um, EDF, or the Eating Disorder Foundation, if you are unfamiliar with us, um, we're a nonprofit founded in 2003 in Denver with a mission to be an effective resource in the prevention and elimination of eating disorders through free and accessible education, support, and advocacy. And though we are a Denver-based um, organization, we're now serving um, at anywhere with connection to internet and have our support services um, virtual and online. Um, a little bit about EQUIP. EQUIP makes gold standard eating disorder treatment, eating disorder care accessible to all people through family-based treatment or FBT, um, delivered at home for lasting recovery. Um, EQUIP was created by experts in the field and people who have been there. EQUIP builds upon the model of care by providing families with a dedicated five-person care team, including a therapist, a dietitian physician, a peer, and a family mentor. Um, and to get some more information about EQUIP and the Eating Disorder Foundation, um, in a little while, I'll put the links in the chat so that you can um, find additional services um, for each of the organizations. I want to quickly take a moment and thank everyone who also um, was able to provide a donation um, donations are not required. It's very important to us to have accessible um, and at no cost um, community and content and education for our community. Um, for those who it is possible, we're always very grateful. Um, and so thank you to those who did that. And I will also, if you're interested in providing a donation, we'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, the chat feature, if we have questions to, um, if we have time for questions, please um, do send those in the chat directly to me and I will deliver those to our presenters if we have time afterwards um, so that they'll stay confidential. Um, all right, and so now to introduce a little bit about our speakers tonight and then I will pass on to them. So this evening we have EQUIP's Director of Lived Experience, J.D. Olette. We have um, the EQUIP Lead Family Mentor, Cheetah Gestellum and the Equip Peer Mentor, um, Pita Mianata. And they are each going to be sharing um, a little bit of information and research on how and why life transitions um, are so important and can be difficult and um, vulnerable for folks with eating disorders. Um, so we're gonna hear a little bit about their stories and some tips as well, hopefully. So thank you so much, the three of you, for joining. And I'm going to pass pass the microphone on to you now. Thanks so much, Sabrina. And thanks so much for the great work EDF does and for having us here. So I'm going to jump right into um, getting the PowerPoint that we have prepared started. Oops. And OK, sorry, give me one. Bear with me. We like to call this at Equip Modeling Imperfection when it takes us just a minute to get there. So is everyone able to see this? We'll head nods. Okay. So welcome to Life Transitions, Staying on Track with Your ED Recovery. A um, little bit about who we are. Um, so I am JD Olette. I am the Director of Lived Experience here at Equip. Um, and I came to doing this work uh, via helping my youngest daughter to recover from anorexia nervosa a decade ago beginning when she was 17 years old. Um, so just developed a real passion for helping other families in this space, mentoring people unofficially, starting to attend conferences, et cetera, et cetera. One thing led to another, and I eventually left my job as an educator to work in this space. And I'm really, really excited to be here and super excited to meet the other two folks that we have here with us too. So Cheetah, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi, welcome everyone. So excited to be here. Um, I'm Tita Gastelum. I'm a lead family mentor at Equip. And my story, my passion for working with eating disorder um, field is I am someone who's been in recovery from 20 years plus now um, from eating disorder. And I'm also a parent who has helped her uh, to support her daughter through an eating disorder. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Tita. <laughs> 
Yeah, hi. My name's uh, Peter Minata, and um, I'm a peer mentor here at Equip. And uh, basically, my interest for being in this field has has come out of um, just you know my own lived experience of supporting uh, a loved one through their eating disorder, and and then kind of processing my own and uh, working through that journey, um, and also trying to become the representation that I want to see for um, Polynesian folk or just like, you know, the communities that I come from um, that, you know, trying to share the care, so to speak. So that's where I'm coming in. Really appreciate that sort of specific call out, Peter. One of the things that's really important, I think, to us at Equip, to EDF as well, right, is really bringing in the broad range of people that are impacted by eating disorders and not just talking about what other people experience and think, but having them speak for your, themselves. And so phenomenal to have the two of you here today um, presenting this. So we're gonna talk about what do we know about life transitions and eating disorders. And I always like to caveat this with what we don't know is enough, right? Because we're all sort of aware of the deficits in research funding and things like that. And we do know some things and we have a lot of theories as well. So we'll talk about those things. Um, talking about how life transitions might impact recovery, all important tips for how to prevent relapse during these life transitions, and how and when to seek help. Um, so let's dive right in. So what do we know about transitions and eating disorders? We know that there are times that are particularly vulnerable to the onset or relapse of an eating disorder. and. Um, one of those times is hormonal shifts and, and the maturation process, right? So we know that there's been a significant amount of research around the hormone piece, particularly in, um, particularly in girls and women, right? That, that research is more robust, but puberty as an onset, uh, menopause as an onset, which is something we don't talk enough about in terms of older people and eating disorders, things like that. Um, we know that um, times of loss and grieving, some seasonal shifts are, seem to be very common, school changes, moving, new medical conditions or diagnoses. Um, and Cheetah and Peta, um, you know, love for you to just sort of like pick up on one of these threads that's been relevant in your life and tell us a little bit about that. Cheetah, you know, would you like to go first? Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. I'll hop on um, first. Um, so uh, I, I think the most relevant to me, especially right now, is just um, new medical conditions slash diagnoses. Um, for for me specifically, it was uh, type two diabetes and, and gout. And um, you know, often the the conventional and general medical that advice that that's given um, is is largely just the simple lose weight. Um, and so, uh, which can be really challenging um, when you're having to be mindful about food, but also be mindful of, um, you know, your eating this disorder that you have and trying to, to hold that lens and um, carry that, that, that balance. Thank you, Peter. We, we talked a little bit, Peter, too, as well about moving. You, you've had that big life transition. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, most definitely. Um, moving transitions in general, um, pretty, pretty difficult, but, um, uh, especially, you know, we have like our home set up and, and, um, and that's usually really resourcing and, and especially like important and such a, a foundation for supporting, um, living in that recovery lifestyle. Um, and to just have that completely like uprooted or just like not have that for a period of time while, while you're transitioning is, is extremely, um, challenging to, to deal with and, and causes you to really pull on like any and every single tool coping uh, skills that you have available. Yeah, I think it's uh, so important. We know that having structure around things can be so helpful and th there you just, it's very hard to structure through a whole huge thing like a move and that sort of thing. Um, Cheetah, what on here really speaks to you? I think um, the one that really speaks to me is the hormonal changes. Um, and when I was in my 20s, I went through two pregnancies and I had an eating disorder. And it was very, it wasn't diagnosed at the time because, you know, when we're pregnant, we go through the, um, the morning sickness. And so it was ongoing. So I don't 
think that the doctor really realized that it was because I had eating disorders during that time. And then experiencing the postpartum depression that really just amplified the eating disorder. Um, and also, so that was something I had experienced um, with. And also my daughter, um, just recently, she has an eight month old baby, and she's been going through um, postpartum depression. And we have noticed um, that it does affect like, you know, that onset of like being vulnerable of getting into a relapse or an eating disorder. So those are the things um, that really, you know, stuck out to me today is to talk about those and, um, you know, just being able to have that self-awareness as well can be sometimes really difficult because of everything that you're feeling with the depression, anxiety, um, going through a pregnancy or postpartum depression. Um, so yeah, those are the, that's what stuck out to me. Yeah. And when we talk about some of this as well, like when we, we touch on loss and grieving, right? It's very common when you're in the midst of a loss to sort of feel very adrift, to maybe have some loss of appetite, all of those sorts of things. And so things that are very normal in a process just can be a particularly vulnerable time for folks with eating disorders. Um, the seasonal shifts um, piece of things, and this is, I'm going to, I try to be really clear about what we know and what we don't know. And I think this is what I would call sort of more anecdata, which is uh, the same story that a lot of people tell, right? It's pretty commonly um, known in the, in the eating disorder industry that like October is a really high month for admissions. And there's something about that fall shift or whatever that really seems to spike this in folks. And that also speaks to the school changes, right? Um, in, in people who are still in school, all of that, you're going back to school, going from one level to another, all those sorts of things, going to a new school, starting college, all of those things are those, those places where, where folks just maybe feel a little less solid. And so kind of thinking of these things in advance, and that's what we're going to talk about, really makes all the difference in navigating without relapse or without a lapse becoming a relapse. So what impact might these transitions have? Um, Peter, do you want to talk in a little bit more depth about your story and how you came through and managed this? Yeah. So um, this year I moved uh, from California to New York. Um, I moved with my partner and my pet rabbit. Um, influences for this move were tied into getting to see and be with my partner's family, getting a massive break on rent. Um, checking out the East Coast and the beauty of remote work not cementing me to a lo certain location. Um, I knew and I felt this move was necessary, but just like the first line says, there was a lot of added stress and logistical challenges. When you're moving and you have your kitchen packed up, you can't just cook yourself a meal, uh, which would have been nice from a cost effective standpoint. Um, on the other hand, it's really hard to keep costs down when you're basically eating out for every meal. Um, we drove cross country to New York and coming from the Bay Area, it was an adjustment, um, something we had to be more wary of with, say, when we would get into a smaller town and everything closes at six. Um, there isn't, you know, some 24 hour Maccas that I could just go to um, trying our best to stay in major cities um, because not all places and all people um, are welcoming of my partner and I's marginalized identities. Um, some places, some gas stations, it felt safer to present in certain ways um, through how we dressed and behaved just to save us from stares uh, and looks, which sometimes just still happened. Um, even holding hands didn't feel like the move in some towns. Um, the amount of planning that went into the move itself was super involved. And a lot of that was to do with our socioeconomic status and having to be extremely thoughtful about how money is being allocated because the margins to work with were pretty tight. Um, even with our planning, it was gobsmackingly expensive. Um, my brain was all over the place. Both my partner and I's eating disorder were challenged. Um, and this was all further complicated and exacerbated by my new diagnoses. So um, as I shared before, I had received within the past year type two diabetes and gout. Um, so remembering to like take medication was hard because it was new to me, uh, switching health plans, and frantically trying to make sure I was able to get a refill while in the middle of my move was stressful. Um, constantly battling the voice in my head that belonged to my doctor, whose advice was, you know, treating my diagnoses, uh, you know, would have, 
required me to subscribe to diet culture and participate in disordered eating again. Um, so prioritizing myself was crucial for making it through that transition. And more importantly, making it out on the other side with my partner still with me. Um, some transitions can really push the threshold, but I felt committed on this journey. So some of the ways that I prioritized my recovery was making sure I had some good solo time, knowing that I don't always have to be spending every breathing moment with my partner on this journey. Uh, we can still have our moments as we travel cross country, but this kind of gave me room for me to check in with myself, take inventory, see what I needed. Also just knowing it's a, a stressful time and that we're not going to be as resourced throughout. Irritability is inevitable and not to take things personally. Um, you know, arguments for the day can kind of end at the day. Um, and leading up to leaving on our cross country move, leaning into my support prior to the move and working at Equip, which were pretty close in terms of timing, um, I was experiencing substantial financial hardship. Uh, and being able to get over feelings of shame, guilt, or inadequacy so that I could ask for the help that I needed and be okay with needing help, uh, recognizing this is just where I'm at now. Um, I was thoughtful about who I asked for help, mainly from a protective standpoint of not feeling safe, just asking everyone. But I was fortunate to learn that I had good people around me and when given the opportunity, friends don't wanna see their friends struggle and people were pretty willing to help out how they could. Um, support came in the form of people paying for meals, um, just sending money to cover a meal or making time to just check in and just be with us slash me in that hardship. Um, one quote that stuck with me for some time that my partner introduced me to was, uh, when I take care of myself, I take care of you. When I take care of you, I take care of myself. And that kind of being locked together, you can't take you know one from the other. So knowing that my self-care is tied to my ability slash capacity to care for others and that taking care of others can also nourish in ways that give back to self, help me prioritize my recovery, give myself permission to prioritize uh, myself and use my support circle. Peter, thank you so much for that really incredibly vulnerable share there. Um, when we were preparing for this, I said, I don't like to talk about it too much before because I think when it happens sort of in the moment in the presentation, it's so impactful and this was certainly uh, for me, a real example of that. And I, what I really, uh, I loved everything you said. And one thing I think was so important was that highlighting the checking in with yourself, that that was a really important piece of things. And I think it's an easy thing to forget to do, like to, I'm moving, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, right? And taking that time and space and, and making it an intentional act. I think that's really um, an incredible thing to, to put a pin in. So thank you. Cheetah. You are up. Yeah, hi. Um, so for me, I think um, it was about four years ago, I lost my parents, um, like within one year of each other. And I was, I had a very close relationship with my mom. Um, so she was the first one to go. And, you know, I think just going like through the whole process of I'm considered the head of household. I'm like considered the elder and I come from indigenous background. And so in my family, it was like, I had to be the strong one. I had to be, you know, the one to be doing everything like, you know, preparing my mom's burial, uh, making sure everybody else was okay. And in all of that, it's like, I, you know, I had this thing where I became lost within that. Um, it's kind of like, you know, we have this tendency that when we're um, the ones that are always giving and always taking care of others, we forget about ourselves. So that made it really difficult for me because I was kind of like on automatic. Um, and I did start realizing that like within a week of my mom's passing, I wasn't really like I didn't have an appetite. Um, and, you know, like, what I do notice that even though like for me and my experience, I had been in recovery for about 20 years plus at that moment, like four, you know, four years ago, um, eating disorder, it still can be manipulative. Like it'll take advantage of anything that it possibly can. And so I did like how we, you know, we experience when we say, I hear that little, it was very faint. Um, but I could still hear like the messages, you know, of all the reasons why I shouldn't be eating or, you know, I needed to like be doing other things instead of taking care of myself. So 
um, you know, luckily I did have um, like a lot of my materials and the skills that I utilized in the past, like to help me get, you know, through my recovery process with the eating disorder. I still utilize like the DBT skills and like I use um, smart goals to con help me continue with recovery. So I immediately took those things out. I'm a very visual person. Um, and so just being able to like go through those things again and like sitting down with my partner and my, my children and being able to say, look, this is like, this was very triggering for me and I really need your help right now. And so being able to go through the SMART goals, which we do have um, an example, like a handout that we're going to share at the end and kind of go through it. What does a SMART goal look like? Um, and also, I think it was really important for me to have like my safety plan, like um, and being able to write down like any behaviors or signs that, you know, my family um, will be would see in me and they did, they started seeing those things. And okay, we see these signs and these behaviors, what are the next steps for me to do, which is um, reaching out to my family, reaching out to my therapist and my nutritionist, um, so that they are able to like, you know, be on alert, okay, you're having, you know, possible relapse, what are our next steps? And also, really taking the time, you know, to like, allow myself, even if it was for five minutes a day to really feel and experience that grief that I was experiencing. Um, and then being able to like, just sit with it and also be able to do things that were going to help me like self soothing, self regulating. Uh, and so those are the things that really helped me and also incorporating um, my indigenous um, healings like holistic health for the eating disorder recovery, um, being able to connect with earth, um, like walking in nature, um, you know, being able to do those type of things also really helped me to like, kind of like be able to say, okay, this is who I am. Like, this is me. And, you know, also like, kind of like hearing my mom, you know, like in my, in my mind telling me, I taught you to be strong, you know, and this is like, I prepared you for these moments because she really did. Um, and so all of those things like that I incorporated really helped me to be able to stay back on, get back on track and, and not having that relapse. Thank you so much, Cheetah. And for those who might know, DBT is, dial or might not know, DBT is dialectical behavioral therapy, and it's an amazing standalone therapy and adjunct to other therapies and things like that. And I'm struck by the way, you know, Peter talked about checking in with himself and you highlighted also making sure other people are checking in with you, right? And that, um, that accountability piece, which is something I'll talk about our story in a moment. And, and that's something that my daughter considered very important to her. So I love, um, because the eating disorder really wants us to be secretive and really wants us to not share with people. And so that extending yourself and making sure, even though it's scary for the eating disorder to have all those people knowing what the warning signs were, it was very protective of you to make sure that that happens. Um, and as your mom said, uh, certainly she raised you to be able to do those things. Uh, as someone who also lost my mother um, some time ago, that's very touching, so that being carried with you. Thank you so much. Um, so my story is actually not really my story uh, completely, right? It's, it's a lot of it is my daughter's story. And just so folks know, my daughter is highly supportive of me sharing all of her business all over the internet. Uh, and in fact, someone once found her Instagram and said, uh, sent her a message and said, doesn't it make you feel super pressured that your mom talks about your recovery all the time? And she said, no, it makes me super accountable. Who am I going to be the schmuck that, that relapses and, uh, and makes my mom look like an idiot? So that's just a sort of a funny thing about that. Um, so her onset um, was the conclusion of her high school athletic career. So all wrapped up in her senior year and that sort of thing. So definitely that was a transition period. When she relapsed, it was when she was transitioning back to college after a break. Um, and so some of the things that we really realized during, you know, sort of both those times and during the, the years that she was sort of actively um, sort of fighting the eating disorder before it was in super strong remission were to pay a lot of attention to things for her that were things like recognizing that um, as a person prone to anorexia nervosa, she has a high metabolism and her metabolism goes higher when she's stressed and anxious. So starting to make that connection about exam times or things like that, like 
oh, you know, I'm a really, you know, I'm going along well doing intuitive eating and I'm headed into this really stressful period of time. So maybe I need to move away from intuitive eating completely and introduce some mechanical eating into my schedule just for a couple of weeks, right? And maybe when I'm really stressed and lose my appetite, my metabolism is going higher. So maybe I actually need to eat more than I normally eat during that time. Um, so those things that were really helpful for her to, um, you know, take the time uh, to like reflect on when those lapses happen or when the thoughts pop up, what is that related to and how can I take this forward as well? One of the things during her, um, when she stayed home for some more treatment um, after the going back to college and then coming home for a little more treatment was really figuring out for her that art was an integral part of keeping herself really um, on track. We, I observed that, you know, gosh, whenever you're sort of like wobbling, you become, the art becomes very important to you and it's a way that you sort of help yourself out of the wobble. Maybe you should do that sort of more consistently in your life. And because I was her mom and she was a young college student, she basically told me where I could go with that. Um, that said, it was still something that she took on board and began to incorporate. So um, I think one of the things, as Cheetah mentioned, when you are a family member watching out for warning signs and things like that, it's the way we have to really, for ourselves, develop a way of raising our concerns that is non-judgmental, non-shaming, very mild, give folks time to process, right? Like if somebody's having behaviors, like, you're having behaviors like what are we going to do about it right that's probably not going to land very well but a gentle sort of i'm observing some of these things you know if we could maybe talk about them in the next week that would be you know maybe very helpful to me to know where things stand that's going to hit a lot a lot differently um and so for her um it was strong cope ahead planning to go back to what she just said about dbt we she had a lot of dbt i had a lot of dbt i'm a huge dbt fan um, so really understanding that sort of very often um, failing to plan is planning to fail. So what's the cope ahead? You know, what are the risks? What are the pitfalls? And using this approach, the, the cope ahead planning combined with the accountability from her family kept her on track, you know, through studying abroad, graduating college, lots of international travel. Um, she went into a career that involved a, a very long physical training period. Um, getting married and now she's um, 24 weeks into a very, very healthy pregnancy. And all of this has really stood her in, in very good stead, all these skill sets that she developed. So what are some tips for, for preparing for life changes, which come and happen to all of us? Um, we thought that there are some questions to ask, right, that are really helpful. Um, first of all, you know, let your team know, um, you know, hey, these are the things that are coming up in my life. Um, you know, I want to put them on your radar. Let's do some coping ahead together. Are you able to help me plan? You know, what is your experience with other patients tell you is going to be helpful and necessary during this time? We also thought as Chi and Pete and I were preparing for it, you know, one of the really foundational questions to ask might be, am I at a place in my recovery to make a big change, right? Sometimes these big changes are inevitable. We cannot do anything about them. We just have to, you know, put our heads down, go through them, that kind of thing. And other times we really can sort of self-reflect on, is it a good time? And I'll, uh, I have an example on this one from my daughter's situation. Cheetah and Pete, I'm interested in you how, if you've made this decision at all, but um, because the career she was going into was going to involve a lot of physical training, um, she actually, and it, I mean, I want to acknowledge that there's a tremendous amount of privilege involved in, in the way she was able to navigate this. Um, but she decided I'm not going to, even though it's what I want to do, I'm not going to do it for like two more years just to have my recovery even more solid, to be even on more solid footing. Um, anything come up for you, uh, Cheetah or Pete, in terms of like, have you made decisions around maybe I will or won't do this thing now at this point in my recovery? Cheetah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, I think for me, it was when I actually started working, like when I was going to start working for Equip, like trying to make the choice of, you know, 
do I want to get back to work? Because at that time, you know, again, I was still taking care of family, making sure everybody was okay. And I was in a time where I wasn't sure if I wanted to start working again. So um, really being able to like sit down with myself and like, you know, there were many times I'm like, what did I get myself into? Um, which, you know, now I'm like, I am super grateful for to have the opportunity to to have the, the position that I have. Um, because not only is it helping me and my family, but, you know, I'm also able to take like, you know, the lived experiences that we have and be able to help support other families. And um, I don't think people realize sometimes how much they give back to you just as much as you're giving to them. Um, so, you know, I think it's really important, again, to just be able to sit down with you and ask yourself, is this a good time? Um, for me to make this change in my life and, you know, kind of like maybe write down the pros and the cons and, you know, talk about it with your loved ones as well, because, you know, it's very important for you to also have that support with you. Um, yeah. Thanks, Cheetah. Um, I think a, a big change that that's present right now, at least uh, for, for me and my partner is just incorporating um, working out. Um, and which is like such a very like you know like oh like what like just um catches attention especially when we're in like the eating disorder like field and stuff and and it's been so something that i've been like balancing and juggling for such a long time um i used to play rugby and i've been really wanting to to hop back into getting into sports um and also just like um like treasuring and my my body and giving it some some like pleasureful movement um and <clears throat> i think one of the the biggest like conversations that i've had to have is just with myself of like okay am i just like um justifying you know like in a kind of secretive way like just wanting to to conform and like be thin and and aesthetically pleasing or is this like um something that you are doing because it gives your body joy um and you love the sport um because there are some kind of things tied into um just the the framing of how i'm engaging with that activity and and um i think it's been something that we've kind of like finally come to an agreement that we can do that with you know the right framing um and knowing that um i not have like any numbers associated i don't have any like looks uh it's more just like you know i want to feel kind of like the certain way um and i want to kind of give, give back to my body mainly just because of my diagnoses um there is like inherent pain that's just with me on a daily basis that i would like to <clears throat> um ease myself off and and feel like i am like worthy of that and deserving of that and that doesn't have to be like a um i don't have to punish myself for wanting that yeah, thank you for that so much to Evie, as you can see, just from that example, you really brilliantly walked us through is those are really good questions to ask yourself and to uh, and if you're afraid of asking them that also tells you something right so everything is. Uh, uh, we talk a lot about I'm going to quote uh, Una Hansen, one of our family mentors on um, data not disaster right. We're just feedback, not failure. We're taking it on and then we're really sort of broadening our view. And, you know, what you've really highlighted is this last point is how can I protect myself during this vulnerable time? And you've identified some things that are really important. You have to be, you have to protect yourself by having the appropriate framing and, and looking out for, you know, for that to drift from the social cultural influences and things that, um, that unfortunately, right, it's a bit of a commentary right there that, right, that we, that our immediate thought about exercise and moving our bodies is sort of diet culture related. And it's sort of the more radical thing for it to be not related to that at all. Um, related to how, as you said, how you feel in your body and the joy of getting back to the person that loved rugby and, and loved it for what it was. Um, so the, making a cope ahead plan. Um, who can you depend on, right? And I want to also acknowledge, right, we do use a lot of talk to your team and um, want to be really clear that it's not, not everyone has access to a team, right? That's a hard, very sad, unfortunate truth of 
just our whole, you know, the medical system and all of accessibility and all of that sort of thing. So um, when we say team to that, that is going to mean different things for different people. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of cover recovery communities and things that can function and help in a lot of ways like this being in spaces like this is helpful and and your other supports as well um, making sure they know you need them and then also sometimes that's going to include getting them a little education or or having them come to some things where they can learn a bit a little bit more because it's not always intuitive how we support someone with an eating disorder right that's that's not something that everyone sort of knows um, uh, right off the hand um, so I love, I think, Chita and Peter, you both had in part of, in part of your stories, um, just that you do have people that will help you. As you said, Peter, it turns out your friends don't like to see you suffer. Um, and Chita, even though you're the one caring for everyone else, it's actually really healthy for you to realize that sometimes you have to say, hey, I've got to take a pause and have people care for me a little bit. Um, and we, um, you know, I think we've seen uh, at Equip, we work in this FBT format, um, but we also, and we work with families, we very much include chosen, chosen family as part of family, right? So family is a very, very broad umbrella. People will bring to it what they, what they want. And coworkers very often can be those people, um, you know, we spend a lot of time at work if we're working, we develop those relationships and things like that. So, you know, your coworkers rooting for you, that might just be saying, um, hey, you know, can you eat lunch with me every day? A lot easier for me to eat lunch if we're talking about whatever it is, the new Marvel universe, whatever's happening, um, uh, that kind of thing. And even though it's scary to ask for that, I think it is, it gets easier once you do it. Would you agree with that, Cheetah and, and Peta? Yeah. And sometimes I think it is really unlikely places where you find that help. And then again, that planning for success um, and, and putting your plan in writing. We somehow lost a little bit of our text here, but um, so much of an eating disorder is forming and keeping up with those habits that keep you on track. So uh, adequate nutrition for your personal needs. This is really what PETA, what you were touching on. This is really related to your personal health journey, wherever and however that's taking place for you as an individual. Um, movement that is joyful. Um, and I love that you, even as an athlete, right, as a rugby player, you're still centering as you move on to this next phase, you're centering the joy of it. And I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe it's part of its camaraderie, team, you know, it's all tied up together. So it's the playing rugby is going to hit for you differently than you know, oh, oh, my doctor said I need to exercise more. And so now I'm going to start just running, even though I really don't like running, that kind of thing. Um, and then um, activities that feed your spirit, as Cheetah said, you know, that was such an important part of her journey is having all having that piece of it is really uh, front and center on keeping her on track. And then again, using those skills, um, whatever they are that really work for you. And noting that you know not every dbt skill is for every person so if you've had some dbt exposure and you're like yeah that wasn't for me sort of encourage you to take another look and maybe go through and find just pick a handful that maybe work for you um cheetah do you want to talk a little bit about um your self-soothe because i think that's a really important um really important piece of things is figuring out how what works for you and self-soothe yeah so I am in my family, um, I think it's important to talk about this as well, um, is we have autism that's, that runs in our family and ADD and ADHD. Um, and so, you know, we have moments like even with myself where you become really dysregulated. Um, and so I do a lot of things that help me like breathing, like doing a lot of breathing exercises. Um, I know I had shared with you that with this before JD, um, it's called the bumblebee breath, which is amazing. And it just kind of like anything that helps me to focus on my senses um, and just make me helps me to feel grounded. Again, like I had mentioned also walking in nature, like I live in the desert on Pascuayaki land. So I take walks and I'm just, you know, I love hiking and just being surrounded by the mountains. Like, um, and I'll just share like a little example, like the mountains, if you think about it, like they're very grounded. You think how their, their foundation is 
and you know all these things happen on them like they go through different seasons you know there's animals that live on it and still it remains grounded and so I really like to like that's something I meditate and focus on um and so it's just like you know like doing the five grounding senses where you have like five things that you see four things you can touch um, so those type of things are what really helps me to like self-soothe. I have like a favorite blankie, my, my fur babies, you know, sometimes I just build a little fort on my bed. Um, and so that creates like a lot of soothing. Like I have a playlist of music that creates, you know, also works with my senses. Um, and I'm also very, um, in tune with plant medicine. That's something, you know, again, from my indigenous culture that, um, my elders taught me is how to work with the plants and not just, you know, like herbal things that you can consume or drink, but just like really like thanking nature and thanking Mother Earth for everything that they provide for us. So those are all things that really are true to me and have helped me in my recovery. Those are great. Thank you so much for, for touching all of those. And I, your breathing, Cheeto is amazing at teaching breathing techniques. So um, that's something that I maybe before we had this appearance, I was like, ah, it's like, a, you know, some of these things I'm thinking of, too, when you were talking about the grounding techniques, I think sometimes we see them on like social media posts or something so often that maybe where they're just sort of, you know, we just sort of pass by them. And really, they ended up on those little graphics or whatever, because they work. And so um, going back to them can be helpful. So some of the skills to try out, and as Pete, uh, Cheetah said, we're going to go more into the smart recovery skills. Um, but Cheetah, do you want to explain what smart recovery is just real quickly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so smart recovery, again, is something that really helped me through my recovery. And it's just like being able to set goals um, that you know are going to be realistic and obtainable. And so I'll just kind of like go through what each of the, um, the letters stand for. Um, so S is to be specific. Um, what is the goal that I want to accomplish? M is for measurable. How will I measure my progress towards this goal? And A is for achievable. How am I able to accomplish this goal? R is for relevant. What is this? Why is this goal important for me? And then T is for time bound. When can I accomplish this goal? And we'll have some examples in the next slide of things that she does use. We mentioned the dialectical behavioral therapy and, and COPA had again, which it, sometimes it sounds like trite, maybe sort of simple and trite, and yet it's so foundational. Um, we were, one of the things that came up right away when we were putting this together, um, and I, it, I can't even remember who, which one of you, Cheetah or Peter, like brought this in, but keeping joy in your life, like really making sure that you do things that you love, and the, the rugby in there that you, you've mentioned you know, speaks to me on that regard as well. And as you said, um, Cheetah being in nature, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, I love to kayak. That's my, you know, grounding place as well. And I do think you get busy and even outside the eating disorder, right? We, life starts happening and then you go, wait, when was the last time I did that thing that I loved, right? And, and I think it's also good to identify things. There's like sort of the bigger outside the house things. And then maybe think of some inside the house without going anywhere things that are things that you know that you love. Uh, one of the things that happens um, because we treat, you know, adolescent, pediatric and adolescent and young adult patients, um, one of the very first things that families will often identify as when they know things are getting better is they had a dance party in the kitchen and they think, oh, we used to have dance parties all the time. And now, you know, we just, we got stressed and overwhelmed and everything and we didn't do them. And then they realized, wow, that our life, we were missing that. We were missing dance parties. Um, we are big fans of recovery roadmaps. Um, and these are written documents that outline the actions needed to stay in recovery. So very much in line with the smart, reco uh, smart recovery skills. And as well for those folks who might be have younger younger kids, particularly college age and things like that, that they're working with. Um, having things in black and white really, uh, when you're at a time when you can't think a lot, it's very helpful to have made decisions in wise mind, which is another uh, little DBT skill, right? When we have our emotion mind and we have our logic mind and 
even though the logic mind people think that logic mind is the best mind, um, and I'm going to call that out because I'm a logic mind person, uh, we're wrong. Logic mind is not the best mind. The best mind is emotion and logic together, and that area where they overlap that in on a Venn diagram would be wise mind. We really have to balance it, balance it all. Self-care, rest is tremendous, right? And, and Peter, I can only imagine moving cross-country, all of that kind of thing. That has to be something that was in short supply that you had to really mindfully seek out. Yeah. Yeah. And then identify and use your short support people. So most people want to be helpful and we can reach out to them. So let's see where I just went in the wrong direction. Um, so those smart skills um, that you were mentioning, um, I'm going to have you, um, Cheetah, talk us through this. Yeah, absolutely. So these are just going to be examples again. Um, like, let's start with the S. What is uh, specific? Like, be specific. What is the goal I would like to accomplish? And again, these are just examples. Um, these are some of the things that I've utilized um, when I was going through, like where I felt like with the grieving and like what I talked about, um, you know, things that I know I needed to work on. So for the example for SB specific, um, I will prepare and eat three meals and snacks in between daily. Um, so the M was measurable. How will I measure my progress through this goal? I will take photos of my meals and snacks and send them to my support person. In that case, my support, I had to support people, one of them who was my daughter um, and also my partner. So that that allowed me to have also accountability for myself. I knew that I was responsible to nourish myself and being able to send those photos um, really made me know that I was really accountable for those things. And then achievable, um, how am I able to accomplish this goal? Um, the example would be like, I will work with my treatment team, my therapist, mentor, or dietitian, or again, right? Like you have support people and it it's going to look different for everyone. It can be your support person, which is like your partner. It could be um, your pastoral counselor. It could be, you know, your indigenous elder, anyone who you feel is, is someone that's really your supportive person um, and relevant are why is this goal important for me? And so for me, it was really important that I kept making progress towards recovery to be able to live my life to its fullest. I knew that if I stayed on goal with my recovery, then I was going to be able to do all the things that I wanted to do. Like we have mentioned before, um, doing things that are joyful to me and, you know, continue spending time with my family, just really living my life. Um, and then T is for the time bound. When can I accomplish this goal? So I think like being again, you know, having you be accountable for for what your recovery goal is, is I told myself, I will do this daily for seven weeks. And then I will check in with myself and my treatment team to discuss my progress. And if I needed to continue going down this, like do another seven weeks, or if I needed to make a new plan. Um, but, you know, again, those are just examples um, about the SMART goals. And, uh, and it's really important that you make the goal where you know it's going to be attainable. Like, be realistic with yourself. Really take the time to sit down and ask yourself these questions and knowing that, yes, I will be able to accomplish that. I love that you incorporated, too, right, that, that they're time-bound. And one of the things I think we know very often is, People who are in ambivalent phase, right? This isn't committing to the rest of your life. It's committing to it for a certain amount of time and then a reevaluation. And so sometimes um, when uh, one of the sayings that really helped my daughter, which was sort of ironic, was uh, when eating an elephant, it's best to take one bite at a time. And so recovery felt like an elephant, right? And so taking those steps, chunking it down, doing the things in small ways individually, and then reevaluating and making a new plan. So um, when and how to seek help. So um, warning signs, um, and I think you both touched on this, um, Cheetah and Peter, right? Create a red flag list with your team, with your support people, whatever that is, right? Because there might be a space where you're like, 
Uh, I, when I'm wobbling, I want the chance to write myself, right? I don't necessarily want everyone in my business at the first sort of like, didn't complete the whole meal, right? I don't want everyone in the house to go on red alert. And, you know, and this is a thing speaking to the supporters on this, because that's my role, right? This is a skill set for us to learn as well. That should maybe be another presentation, right? Like, how do you watch your loved one struggle a little and know when it's time to sort of really kind of go in a little bit harder? Um, identifying those individual signs for you that might indicate that you'll be vulnerable or slipping. And those are going to be different for every person. Having that crisis or relapse prevention plan created proactively, right? And I think this goes to sometimes when we're, we come through something and we're in a really good place, we just want to leave it behind. We want to put it back in the, you know, we just, okay, that's done. We're, I'm done with that. It's over. And my experience in eating disorders in life is that that's a really good way to have it kind of pop back up and, and really surprise you when you least expect it. So create that plan when you're feeling great, when you're in your best frame of mind. Don't wait, right? We know eating disorders are not a wait and see thing. So if we're like, well, I'm going to wait and see how much worse it gets, it's probably going to get worse, right? And then it's going to be harder. And particularly with eating disorders, we talk a lot about um, neuroplasticity, right? The closer your brain is to its healthiest state, the easier it's going to get be able to get back to its healthiest state. So when we act quickly, it's easier on us. It's easier on the people around us. Our brain is very happy about it because it doesn't have to go too far back to remember, oh, those were, that was the good routine, the good habits, the, the way of life that was really making me happy. And then in terms of resources, um, support groups, you know, EDF has support groups. There's other places as well. One of the things, and we've talked about this, Sabrina, right? is that um, the pandemic for all its, you know, all of the things that it brought us that are, that are not awesome, brought us virtual care, which is more and more being proven to be helpful. And it brought something like EDF to be able to reach people all over the country instead of just locally. So if you haven't looked at those resources for a long time, you know, maybe take another look at that. Um, we talked about um, smart recovery. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about a lot, and we're, we're getting near our time, so we won't spend much more on it, but social media, you know, following that recovery-minded content, curating your feed, curating your feed, um, you know, go to someone who you really like and see who they follow and maybe follow a bunch of those accounts. And at the same time, maybe unfollow some accounts that you're like, eh, yeah, I kind of don't feel great when I finish with this one. Um, and then want to put a plug in for lived experience recovery coaches. They can be a great support in addition to the team. And, you know, we certainly believe um, that everyone has a role and a place in this. So, you, you know, your, cl your clinical help, your licensed clinical help is important as well. And also you can get really amazing help from people who have been there, done the work, and are now on the recovery coach side of things. So, if you are interested um, in getting in touch with Equip, you've got our information here, equip.health. Again, we are currently uh, treating up to age 24 in 2023. Look for us to roll out an adult program that I'm super excited about and will again be geared toward everything we've talked about today, right? You hear us saying again and again, like your support circle, bringing those people in, educating those people so they can be the best help for you they can. So we are now at question time. I'm going to stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Um, firstly, in the chat, I made an error because I said 26, but so currently Equip is serving ages. JD, can you repeat that? Um, 6 to 24. 6 to 24. Okay. And then look forward in the future mm -hmm. for new programming with different ages. Okay. Excellent. Um, so one of the questions we have right off the bat goes really well with you with what you were just talking about, which is really maintaining, uh, well, finding new and then maintaining community throughout recovery as it can, can lead on, right, um, as long as we're here. So one of the questions that we received um, is, I know each program is different, um, but in general, what happens after someone is in um, IOP or intensive outpatient treatment? Um, do most people get a, then an outpatient therapist and then and then kind of wean their time as they see a therapist? Um, so that was our question, and I and I know there's 
also probably many different um, um, answers to that. So I wanted to kind of share it with everyone um, to, to respond to. Yeah. I mean, I think ideally, right, we know that you don't recover from an eating disorder in a residential treatment stay. It's just a longer term illness than that, you know, or in a PHP stay or in that kind of stuff. So I absolutely think it's very wise to begin to build a team, even when you are um, in, in a setting, right? Um, and I want to also... Um, put out in there right we're in a very hard place with all of this um eating disorder therapists have been uh working themselves absolutely to the bone to try and help all the people that need help during this pandemic which you know gosh we should have put that things that can cause relapse pandemics um would, we would put up there now as well right so getting as early as you can i think um starting to get your team together and i'm a, i the other flip side of the pandemic though right is that virtual care is now a lot more possible so if you are sort of only thinking like who can i find in my town or who can i find in my city one of the things i would say is maybe broaden your broaden your search right to people in your that are licensed in your state and things like that a lot more people doing telehealth and uh, the research is really showing that telehealth can be just as effective as in person so that's very gratifying uh cheater peter do you want to add anything to that go ahead peter um <clears throat> only thing i'll add real quick is just like yeah with uh, with virtual care it's it's uh the rate it's definitely like you know legitimizing itself more um and also, especially, you know, not all of the other cares or resources, places are accessible. Um, and it, for a lot of people, uh, it's been like a nice segue because it's better than nothing. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to speak on something that I think is really important that PETA actually touched on earlier was, you know, sometimes like I think about the marginalized communities, like, you know, you may be thinking if you are a part of that, I was a part of that community, um, you know, when I had, was trying, you know, to find people to like really help me through my recovery of from the eating disorder. And so there are people like, you know, I do this myself in my community also, where there are people who provide on a, based on a sliding fee scale on scholarship. So there is help out there and they also provide it via virtual. Um, you know, and so a lot of times, like if you have Medicaid or Medicare, they are able to, you know, they have like this information too. So if you reach out to them before, like coping ahead, you know, make sure that you reach out to, you know, even like, you know, some friends or, you know, family, maybe they know someone who is working with people and helping them to go through their recovery and they are able to provide that service to the marginalized community. So I just wanted to put that out yeah. there. No, I think that's great. And I wanna call out a couple of groups and this is not by any means uh, a very uh, an exhaustive list at all, right? These are a couple of groups that I'm familiar with that might help with, with folks with some marginalized identities. Uh, Nalgona Positivity Pride um, that Gloria Lucas runs is a really good source. And you can become part of that community, get referrals from people and then fed up. Um, also another really great support um, serving the trans community. And that's kind of a way to network and get, get referrals and things like that. Um, thinking about potentially university affiliations where people might be needing to get clinical hours, um, things like that um, are also like, you know, places to go and start thinking about this. Thank you all so much. We've reached the top of our hour. Um, in the follow-up email that the recording will be sent, um, I will put in the link some of those resources that you were just sharing of all the many different organizations that have like really, uh, you know, supports for more specific, you know, something that's going to fit with you. So that's, um, that's the importance of having such a, a, a wide list uh, to look from. So I'll put as much as I can in there. Um, JD, Cheetah, and Pita, thank you so much for sharing um, your, your experiences and, and how you've been able to get through the hard times. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's always a pleasure. We really appreciate it. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you.